Good morning, and a very warm welcome to our service. To everyone joining us online, whether you are watching this live or as a recording during the week, and wherever you are in the world, we extend a very warm welcome to you all. Our service today is being led by our very own Peter, good fellow, and we look forward to hearing his message. I would also like to thank everyone involved in preparing both the service and the church for today. <clears throat> Please join us for tea and coffee after the service in the hall. Just be careful as you go down the steps. I have two notices. <clears throat> Next Saturday, the 3rd of February, from 10.30, Onwards is our monthly charity coffee morning in aid of Devon blood bikes. Please join us if you are able, <coughs> sorry, please join us if you can, and if you're able to help on the day, please speak to Jenny. And the other notice concerns next Sunday. Please note that there will be an opportunity to discuss what is currently happening in our circuit, including the outcome of the first circuit vision day, when we will be holding a meeting with Brenton after morning worship on Sunday the 4th of February, that's next Sunday. Because of this, there will be no coffee served that morning. Please stay if you are able, and please feel free to bring your own drinks. Thank you. Much better. The psalmist wrote, How wonderful are the things the Lord does. All who are delighted with them want to understand them. So that we can, in fact, join that happy band of people who want to understand what the Lord says, we will firstly sing number 20, Be still, for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here. Number 20.
we hear the prayer now, which is collect for today. That special word, the collect, meaning that here we have a chosen prayer which will be said by hundreds of people throughout the land today, whatever denomination they are in. After which we shall in fact confess our sins to God and then thirdly we will sing the Lord's Prayer. So let us pray. The collect for today. God of heaven and earth, whose power is made fully known in your pardoning mercy, ever fill us with your grace, that entering more fully into your promises, we may come to share in the good things of heaven. You have taught us, Lord, that all our doings without love are worth nothing. Send your Holy Spirit and pour into our hearts that most excellent gift of love, the true pond of peace and all virtues. That being so, Lord, we pray that you will forgive us for all those forgetful moments when we have not considered your gift of love. Forgive us when we have in fact done things which are definitely not loving. We pray that as we confess, you will pardon these our sins, for we ask it in through the name of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. And we now sing together the Lord's Prayer. We now sing again, 322, how sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. 322.
And we now hear the appointed Old Testament lesson for today, which is from the book of Deuteronomy. And it's from this particular reading that I've chosen to base my words of wisdom that you'll hear later. So here we go with the Old Testament. The Old Testament reading is taken from Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 to 20, and I'm reading from the New International Version. The prophet. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb. On the day of assembly, when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord of our God, nor see this great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, what they say is good. We'll raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites. And I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. Myself, will call on account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded or a prophet who speaks in the name of God's is to be put to death. Amen. So we sing again, and even as I say that, it makes me think, when I've heard preachers say, now we'll sing again, it seems to me crackers, because the hymn that's announced, you're not going to sing it again, having already sung it. <laughs> we are going to sing, one, two, seven. And we're going to sing the great Jehovah's praise. All praise to him belongs, who kindly lengthens out our days, demands our choicest songs. So let's indeed think of that. We're going to sing a choicest amongst our songs. One, two, seven.
Do sometimes particular lines in a hymn catch your attention specially? Verse 4 in that one always gets me, and particularly this morning, of your love. I pray that that indeed may be true as we all leave this place. We will in fact, on our faces, show the wonders of God's love. We're now going to hear the New Testament reading appointed for today, which comes from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. I'm reading from the Good News Bible, and it's Corinthians chapter 1 to 13. The questions about food offered to idols. Now, concerning what Paul wrote about food offered to idols, it is true, of course, that all of us have knowledge and they say such knowledge, however, puffs a person up with pride, but love builds up. Whoever thinks he knows something really doesn't know as he ought to know. But the person who loves God is known by him. So then, about eating the food offered to idols, we know that an idol stands for something that does not really exist. We know that there is only the one God. Even if there are called gods, whether he in heaven or on earth, and even though there are many of these gods and lords, yet there is for us Sorry. <laughs> there is only one God, the Father, who is the creator of all things and for whom we live. And there is only one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created and through him we live. But not everyone knows this truth. Some people have been so used to idols that to this day, when they eat such food, they still think of it as food that belongs to an idol. Their conscience is weak, and they feel they are defiled by the food. Food, however, will not improve our relations with God. We shall not lose anything if we do not eat nor shall we gain anything if we do eat. Be careful, however, not to let your freedom of action make those who are weak in the faith fall into sin. Suppose a person whose conscience is weak in this matter sees you, who have called knowledge eating in the temple of an idol, Will not this encourage him to eat food offered to idols? And so this weak person, your brother for whom Christ died, will perish because of your knowledge. And in this way you will be sinning against Christ by sinning against your Christian brothers and wounding their weak conscience. So then, if food makes my brother sin, I will never eat meat again, so as not to make my brother fall into sin. Thanks be to God.
Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we place upon your table our gifts of love. We pray that they may be blessed and richly fill the world with love because of the love that we have shown you. Dear Heavenly Father, it's only money, we say, but it's something special that we place here, dear Lord, because we wish that you will put your blessing on it and so make the money much richer than it appears to be. We ask this in and through the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. So it's from the Old Testament that I've chosen my text. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, and I will put my words in his mouth. I will raise up a prophet like you, and I will put my words in his mouth. And may it be that my words may indeed be God's words for us all today. And it reminds me of a story of three preachers who thought that they had God's words to share with all the people. And all three of them met together in the local cafe to talk shop. And as you might imagine, they all went about their jobs very differently, and one of them began to brag how good he was at preaching and bringing people to conversion. Well, the other two, as you can well imagine, took issue with that because they thought that they were better than he was. So they decided to have a little competition. And they decided that they would go into the woods, look for a bear, and use their best methods of preaching to convert that bear. So they all went in the woods. They each found a bear. They did their thing. And then after each of them had got out of hospital, they met back at the cafe to debrief and see who had had the best results. Well, the priest was pretty scratched up and was still wearing some bandages from the encounter with the bear. And they, he told his story. I went out and I found a bear that was good and angry and in need of God's peace. And things between the bear and me got a little bit rough. So I quickly grabbed some holy water and sprinkled it on him while saying three Hail Marys. And I kid you not, that bear became just as quiet as a little lamb. In fact, he will be coming here to church next week for confirmation and to take his first communion. At which point, the Baptist stood up to tell his story. He was in even worse shape than the priest. Not only did he have scratches and bandages, but he had a cast on one arm and a patch over his left eye. And he began to speak well, Sonny, we don't sprinkle water. I went out and found the meanest bear in the woods I could find, and I gave him the best 
fire and brimstone sermon that you could imagine. Well, that bear was so convinced in his soul, he rose up and attacked me. So I grabbed him and threw him in the creek and baptized him right there and then. And I kid you not, that bear rose up out of the water just as calm as a little lamb and he signed up for a membership class and will be joining us next Sunday. Finally, it was the rabbi's turn to tell his story, only he was in a horrible shape. He was in a full body cast. He had an IV drip and had to be rolled out to join the others on a hospital bed. He was obviously in agony and pain, but he tried to tell his story and he groaned, you know, now I think back on it, preaching would have been a much better idea for me. Circumcision probably wasn't the best approach. <laughs> <coughs> well, that's just a humorous way to make a simple point. We all have our ways of thinking and doing and saying things that we think are best. And sometimes our way of thinking and saying and doing can get someone hurt. So that brings me back to my text. I will place... Among you a prophet, and I will put my words in his mouth. I will put my words in his mouth. Which is what the three who met at the cafe thought. But I ask, is there any word from me or from you today? that is a word from the Lord. We want to know God's expectations of us and his will for us. And when we are in crisis or face a decision, we long for divine guidance and grace. We long for a word from beyond. And that's why we worship, to thank and glorify God and enjoy his divine presence. Worship, you know, comes from an old Anglo-Saxon word. We say worship, but it comes from worth-ship. W-O-R-T-H, ship. And so worship means to ascribe supreme worth to God. And when we come to worship, to worship, we come to hear a word from beyond to catch a glimpse of the divine presence, to discover heaven's will and grace for our lives. And just as Israel sought to know God's will, so do we. Even as we come to worship, we hope to gain insight into God's work and will in our lives. God responded to Israel's need with a unique gift, the prophets, who are messengers of God to his people. And although today we have the advantage of having God's word in the scriptures, God still provides a prophetic ministry as well. And in the reading from Deuteronomy, we first of all hear of the promise of a prophet. The Israelites were forbidden to consult fortune tellers and spiritualists, and they were to avoid pagan religious practices. And in some respects, that's what was behind the New Testament reading of feeding the idols 
And there are times when we do indeed feed the idols. I think of the way in which so many folk lovingly look after their car and feed the car with all sorts of wonderful spit and polish. It doesn't necessarily make the wheels go round better, but there is a feeling that you have to feed it and keep it going well. How would all of those cars know that they're being well fed? It's a nonsense question, really. So we need to take care and think carefully of the way in which we do need to think twice about the way in which we feed our idols. God has spokespersons in every generation. God isn't playing hide and seek. He wants to know us and he wants us to do his will. And he's made known to us through his prophets. And although they often did point to future events, biblical prophets were not fortune tellers as much as forth tellers. They tell forth what is God's word. Inspired preachers are forth-tellers, not fortune-tellers. And that leads us to thinking of what Deuteronomy said next about the power of a prophet. God promised to raise up his prophets and put his words in their mouths, enabling them to speak all his commands. That's the power that the prophets have. They have God's words in their mouths. Any power the prophets possessed, derived from their divine calling and the continuing presence of God in their lives, and the prophets proclaim the life, the teaching, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is their powerful message. And then last of all, we need to stop and think about how can we know a prophet when there is one? So the test of a prophet, in fact, is something that those three preachers that I told in the story thought that they had understood. It's dangerous to presume on God and think too highly of oneself. And that's why we heard about the three clergymen. They thought too highly of themselves. And each, in competition, thought they could prove that I am better than you. And that's the mark of a false prophet, as we read in the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 28. The test of a true prophet is the fulfillment of God's purpose. And the proof of the prophet is the authenticity of his or her preaching. God speaks in many ways. He reveals himself in the beauty and dependability of the natural world, which is his creation. He also speaks in the human conscience, giving us a sense of right and wrong. And he communicates in history as well. And God's will and purpose are discovered, of course, in the Holy Scriptures that we've already shared today. The clearest word from God is heard in the person of his Son. One writer 
has observed, so I've read. Jesus is the best picture God ever had taken. Jesus is the best picture that God had ever taken. Imagine that. God standing there with a the camera, takes a picture, and it's a picture of Jesus, the best picture he had ever taken. So when we think that the prophets are bringing us the word of the Lord, I want us to leave this place today remembering that, yes, there is a word from God. And what we must then ask ourselves is, are we listening for it? Am I listening to hear the word of God? However that word may come from prophet, priest or king, God is speaking to us each and every day, each and every, all the day, in whatever time and place we are. So there we have it. We can agree with the words of the psalmist that I began our service with. How wonderful are the things the Lord does. All who are delighted with them want to understand them. Amen to that. How wonderful are the things the Lord has done. Amen. We now share a few minutes of quiet in prayer of intercession, thinking of all those people and places around the world who do need to hear the word of the Lord from prophet, priest, or king. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we have heard how it is that you do indeed speak to us each and every day. And we pray that the words that we've heard today will help us to be mindful of those around the world who don't share a quiet time like we are sharing now, speaking to you and hearing your word. We think of those who are in places where they are suffering, places where there is stress and strain, places where there is war and hurt. Help us, O Heavenly Father, in the quiet, each in our own way, particularly to think of one such place. And we pray, dear Lord, that your love may shower down upon all of the people there and bring them, this morning at least, some peace. Dear Lord, no matter what part of the world it is that we each in our own hearts have thought of, we pray that your power may indeed fall upon them and help to raise them up from the dreadful feelings that they have. And we pray that the people who oppress will be as much part of your love, and that they may feel how it is that they must change. Heavenly Father, there are so many people, millions around the world, 
who need to feel your love. And we pray that they may now, as we remember them, may feel that love richly in their bodies and souls. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, ever to be mindful of those who, as we enjoy life, they do suffer. We pray, dear Lord, that wherever they are, north, south, east or west of us, we may indeed feel that they have been blessed by you this day. We offer all of these people and all these places to your love and care. And we ask it in the name of Christ our Saviour. Amen. And so we sing our last hymn. 368, when morning gilds the skies, my heart awaking cries, may Jesus Christ be praised. 368. out together that last line all together then may Jesus Christ be praised may God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit 
be with us and with our loved ones wherever they may be, this day and evermore. Amen. Amen.